turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. Our passage this morning is going to be in chapter 3, and we're going to be reading verses 18 through 22. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. This is what it says. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Praise be to God. This is the very words of the Lord. On January 25th, 1945, victory was achieved. Sweet victory. For six weeks, the American army had been involved in its most significant battle in World War II. It was called the Battle of the Bulge. This was the Germans' last major offensive. And battling harsh winter conditions, continual shelling, massive casualties, eventually the American army prevailed. Victory. And when there is victory, the emotions of relief and confidence and pride and joy occur in the days that follow. For those who endured, for those who endured, the overwhelming dynamic of victory was profound. Victory, sweet victory. I wonder what some of the greatest victories in your life are. Nobody likes to lose. And as we turn our attention this morning to the book of 1 Peter, and in chapter 3, we recognize that for some people, as we've been going through this book, the ideas that Peter has been talking about, the ways that God calls us to live, have been difficult. To intentionally live a humble life. To live as subject to other people or in submission to them. To live a life that endures suffering. These things feel like losing. <laughs> and nobody likes to lose, especially losing the game of life. And yet it would appear that God called his son Jesus to live in a manner like this, and he calls the followers of Jesus to do the same. And this is hard. Suffering for doing good is hard. Submitting to unjust leaders is hard. Many of us have bristled at the notions of 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 3 to endure these types of things. And underneath it, I think underneath that bristling, is the desire for vindication. When you are treated unjustly, you want vindication. And you want it right now. And the great news of 1 Peter chapter 3, the news that we proclaim today, is that if you are living life with the burden of suffering, if you are submitting to unjust leaders who are over you, if you experience suffering for doing good for the sake of the gospel in your job or in your social circles or in your family or beyond, the good news today is that you will have vindication. Your vindication is guaranteed 
by Jesus' victory. And this passage describes that victory in four ways. And so, friends, as we think about these things together, rejoice with me this morning at the victory of Jesus and what it means for you. We see how this victory is won. It's won through what we call penal substitution. Those two words, penal substitution, the substitution of a penalty. And we see it right away in verse 18. Look with me. He says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Right here in verse 18, we see one of God's clearest expressions of love for humanity. The very center of the good news itself is found in Jesus' suffering. And that's why it says he suffered for sins. Now, some of us go through life thinking that our sin is not that big of a deal. I mean, after all, we all sin. You sin, I sin. We sin multiple times a day, probably. We all fall short of God's standard of holiness. But if you think your sin is not that big of a deal, then why does Jesus have to suffer for it? He suffered for sins. Sin breaks our relationship with God in the moment. And sin breaks our relationship with God completely. He had to suffer for sins because sin is a big, big deal. So serious, in fact, that because of our sin, the Bible teaches us again and again that we cannot have access to God Now imagine the type of offense, in all of the relationships you have, imagine the type of offense that it would take for you to sever a relationship completely. I mean, I have made a lot of mistakes in in my marriage with Amy, but I've never made a mistake that has ended the marriage. (laughs) And here's the thing. Every sin that we commit is serious enough to end our relationship with God. But he offers us a way to be brought to him. There's a lot of substitutes in the world today, aren't there? I think about the dairy substitutes that don't really taste as good as real dairy, or the sugar substitutes that allow you to drink more soda than you probably should. I read uh, a couple years ago that a man in Massachusetts actually sued Dunkin' Donuts because they put a butter substitute on his bagel. And when you think about substitutes, you think about a substitute that comes into the game and the substitute isn't as good as the player that he or she is replacing. But friends, i got to be honest. I am so glad that we have a substitute. His name is Jesus. That's why verse 18 says that he suffered once for sins that he might bring us to God. This substitute paid a price that we couldn't pay. He brought us to a place that we couldn't go. He did something that we couldn't do. He was our substitute in this. And this is why the text highlights it with this phrase. Do you notice it? The righteous for the unrighteous. This was a hero's death. I mean, what type of innocent person functions as a suffering substitute for those who are guilty? Only a hero does that. And so our hero, Jesus, who is perfect, was the only suitable substitute to pay the penalty for sin. And here's the implication for you, very practically. Because of Jesus' substitute through faith in him, you can have a relationship with God. Because of Jesus' substitute for you in paying the penalty for sins, you can go through life with confidence with God. You don't have to question every single day whether or not you're going to be in good standing. 
Jesus places you there because of his substitution. And because of this substitute of Jesus, you can have eternity with God. Victory over sin is what's talked about in verse 18. And Jesus' victory brings us to God. This was his mission. And he accomplished it through penal substitution. The second aspect of this victory is seen in the next few verses. This is how the victory of Jesus is proclaimed. He proclaimed it by preaching to spirits in prison. Look with me at verses 19 and 20. This verse, or these verses, have caused more heartburn and consternation among theologians for the last 1,900 years than almost any. It says, Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, verse 19, in which he, being Jesus, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. What does it mean that Jesus preaches to spirits in prison? Why did he do this? What did he say? When did he do this? What's the point? There are three or four different views on what this could mean. I'm not going to take time to address them all. I just want to address the two most predominant of them. Some people in history, particularly in the Catholic Church, have used this verse to justify the idea of the existence of purgatory and a second chance for people after death. Purgatory, as an idea in the Catholic faith, is one in which a place where you go after you die to suffer for your sins before you are purified enough to go to heaven or ultimately damned to hell. And they believe that Jesus went to this prison, this purgatory or this hell, and he preached for the three days that his body lay in the grave. He preached to those who had not previously believed, and he gave them another chance to repent. There are a lot of problems with that view. My guess is that when we read this verse, probably that view is the one that pops into mind for most of us, but I want to tell you why I don't think that it's correct. Number one, we see that nowhere else in the Bible is there an indication that people have a second chance after death to put their faith in Jesus. In fact, in Luke chapter 16, verse 26, we see this story of Lazarus and the rich man. Do you remember the story? It's the vision of the man dying in which they are separated between heaven and hell and the rich man wants just a drop of water on his tongue to come down from heaven to him in hell. And it says that a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you, heaven to hell, may not be able and none may cross from there to us. There's no transferring of spirits or souls between heaven and hell. The chasm is fixed. Likewise, we see in Hebrews 9.27 that as is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So in short, you have an opportunity in this life to put your faith in in the Lord Jesus. And this life is your only chance. There's no do-overs after you die. If you've sinned, who is going to pay the penalty for your sin? Jesus offers you the chance to have it taken away, to be erased, gone forever, so that you can be brought to God. Have you made that decision? So, if Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison doesn't mean purgatory and giving people a second chance, what does it mean? I think what it means 
is that in the physical realm, Jesus' body was put to death. In the invisible realm, his spirit was raised up. And through his death and resurrection, he achieves victory. And he takes that moment to proclaim victory to these spirits in prison. The spirits in prison are likely either disobedient humans, it says before the days of Noah, wicked, wicked, wicked people who were so wicked in their ways that God flooded the earth. Or, even more likely, because the word spirits is almost always used in the Bible to talk about angels or demons, supernatural spirits, these spirits are those and who are fallen angels along with Satan and demons who are trying to overthrow God and steal humanity for themselves. And so when Jesus proclaims a message of victory to spirits, he stands to the demons and to God and to Satan himself this message that says to every one of them, it is finished. I have won. Satan has lost. All of those who oppose God have been diminished. Victory is mine. What a proclamation. Could you imagine being part of the host of heavenly angels who are witnessing the victorious Son of God look upon his enemies and say, it's over. Those who would destroy him. Those who would seek to steal the ones that he loves. What an incredible sight. And what a terrible sight that it will be on the day when those who opposed him will meet their final judgment as they are thrown into the lake of fire. Here's the implication for you. The implication is this, that if Jesus is victorious over the devil and all of his spirits, then no matter what the spiritual forces of Satan do, No matter what this world looks like, no matter what kind of incredible guilt they press down upon you in your moment of weakness, they will always be functioning from a defeated position. They will not prevail in your life if you are one of Christ's believers. Victory over spiritual forces. And the victory has been proclaimed to them. And your vindication is guaranteed because of this victory. So Peter describes the victory of the Son of God how this victory was won. He describes how Jesus proclaimed it to his enemies. And now he talks about how this victory is displayed. And we see how this victory is displayed in baptism. And here again, we see some verses that are, at first glance, very difficult for us to understand. But the closer you look, the clearer they become. So look at verse 20 and 21 with me. He says, He proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight, persons were brought safely to the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you read this concerning phrase that says, baptism now saves you. And you say, what on earth does that mean? Because as I read the whole New Testament, you see again and again and again that faith is the thing that saves you, that God's grace bestowed on your life is saved you, that there's nothing you have to do to actually be saved, that there's no religious ritual that you need to be saved, that you don't need any mediator between God and man except for the Lord Jesus himself. And so what on earth does Peter mean when he says that baptism saves us? This is one of those times that you just have to look very closely 
at the words being used in an attempt to understand. And in doing so, we notice that Peter is making a correlation here. He's making a correlation between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. And he gives really three points of correlation that are seen. Point number one is the hostility to God in the days of Noah and in the days of Peter. Correlation number two is the water of the flood (laughs) and the water of baptism. And correlation number three is the rescue, those who are rescued by the ark and those who are spiritually rescued by Jesus, we might say through his resurrection. The water of the flood was an agent of death. Anyone who was submerged in the water died. Likewise, we see in Romans chapter 6 that those who enter the waters of baptism are portraying death, a spiritual death. When they go under the water, it symbolizes death. Their old self is gone. The water brings destruction. But just as God rescued Noah from the waters of destruction in Genesis, so too does Jesus rescue those who have faith in him in their spiritual death. He does so, as it says in verse 21, by resurrection. And so you read about this in Romans chapter 6 and and in Colossians chapter 2. This is what Colossians chapter 2, 12 to 14 says. It says, having been buried with him, that's Jesus, in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with him having forgiven us of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So Noah exercised faith in God, that God would save him from judgment that was coming to the sinners of the world. It was faith, faith that was exercised by Noah. The ark was the outward sign of his faith. It was the vehicle that resulted in his physical salvation. Likewise, friends, it is faith in Jesus that saves us, and baptism is the outward sign of that faith. It is not a mechanical ritual that removes spiritual dirt, it says here. It's so much bigger than that. Baptism is the display of complete and total victory. You might even say that baptism is the display of Jesus' victory applied to you personally. It's one thing to say that he's victorious in the heavenly realms over the spirits. It's something a little bit more particular to say he's victorious in your life. And that is what baptism displays. Now, in the Western world, we might fall under the mistake of taking baptism too lightly or thinking that it's not that big of a deal. But I I love the analogy that helps us think about it this way. When a lady gets married to a man, she puts on a ring, or he puts the ring on her finger. The ring doesn't make her married. She could be married without a ring, but just like you could be saved without being baptized. But what the ring does is that it serves as the sign that she's married. Now, there's a lot of times when you will observe men and women conversing with each other, and as they're conversing with each other, you can see like there's a little chemistry going on there. And before long, the eyes of the man start to head south, looking down toward the left hand to see if there's a ring on that finger to see if she's been spoken for, to see if she has been committed to another. Now, I'm certain that a wife who refuses to wear a ring would almost always insult just about any man she's married to. 
He might even take it as a point of rejection. The ring is more than just a piece of jewelry. The ring is a piece of jewelry that represents something. It represents an institution. It represents a covenant. It represents a relationship. And like the ring is symbolic in marriage, baptism is the sign of our covenant with God. And so that's why we take it seriously. The proclamation of Jesus' victory is at stake. So when we baptize people, we gather hundreds of people into this room. You invite your friends and your family over on that side by the baptismal tank. We listen and we watch and we celebrate because that's what you do when major victories happen. When a victory happens in the context of war, the people flood into the streets to celebrate the victory. When the victory happens in the life of the Christian, the Christians all gather around and they celebrate the victory with excitement and hope and emotions and relief and joy as life will never be the same again. And everybody says, wow, look what God did in that person's life. God takes baptism seriously. And so do we. And so if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus and you've not been baptized, you have the opportunity with your church family to proclaim that victory in your life. And we know, friends, that your vindication ultimately will come. It's guaranteed because of Jesus' victory. We see how the victory was won, how the victory was proclaimed, how the victory is displayed. And finally, let's consider together how this victory is ongoing in its nature. It's ongoing because Jesus himself is on the throne. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but there's a couple things that have happened this week in the life of our country. And I have some good news no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, there is the victorious one who is on the throne. Listen to these glorious words. It says, Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers, having been subjected to him. And this proves in his ultimate vindication that has an implication for yours. Did you notice that last word, those last couple words? All of these beings have been subjected to him. We've heard about that word a lot the last couple weeks. To be subject to, to be subject to, to submit to, to submit to. Why can Jesus tell us to be subject to human institutions, to be subject to our employers, to be, for wives to be subject to their husbands, even though those things are difficult, and even though those things all follow his earthly example, who was subject to the authorities on earth that ultimately killed him? Jesus can command these things because now he has been vindicated and in fact his vindication is displayed in the fact that all things are now subjected to him. Be subject, be subject, be subject. All things are subjected to me. This is the great reversal. This is the thing that they would have never thought could have possibly happened. This is the sign of his victory. All of the enemies of Christ will be subjected to him continually, and they are even during this day. And if you're found, found to be one of his followers, then this means that the enemies of Christ cannot ultimately inflict lasting harm on you either. And that leads to a really important point. You need to know that Jesus did not achieve victory over sin. He did not achieve victory over death. He did not achieve victory over the devil. 
just for the sake of victory. Jesus did not achieve victory over sin, death, and the devil just for himself. Jesus achieved victory over sin, death, and the devil for you. You are the one who is the intended beneficiary from it. Your vindication (laughs) is guaranteed because of it. And so when you go through life and you feel like you're alone, you feel like you're defeated, you feel like you're suffering, you wonder if you can ever live faithfully to God, you need to know that yes, you can because the victory has already been won on your behalf. Maybe you're here today and you've been walking away from God or simply you're ignoring God for some time now. You know that this means that Jesus' mission in life is to bring you to God. And the next step for you if you're ignoring God is to make your active faith decision in His Son and be restored to Him. Maybe you're here today, you've been saved for some time, but for whatever reason you haven't been baptized. You haven't proclaimed Jesus' victory in your life the way that He calls you to proclaim it. You're like the husband who won't go out with his wife in public or the wife who won't wear her wedding ring around town. Peter shows us that God takes this seriously, this proclamation of victory. And so your next step is to pursue, is to call the church office and talk to one of our pastors about being baptized. Maybe others of you have suffered. Maybe you are suffering right now. And you don't think that God would allow such a thing or that Maybe it's not worth it to follow him if he does. Or maybe you feel like you are in the battle of the bulge of your life. That your spiritual temperature is freezing cold (laughs) as the snow rains down upon you. Or that you are ducked down in the bunker as the shells of the enemy explode around you. And you are counting the hours as they turn into days, as they turn into weeks, wondering when this season will pass. But then you look up and you see a battle captain on a great white horse. His name is Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white, and pure were following him on the white horse. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When you know that the victory is already won, that your vindication is coming, that the Holy Spirit of God himself indwells you and empowers you, you, Christian, can go through just about anything. You can submit to unjust leaders. You can suffer for doing good because your vindication is guaranteed through Jesus' victory. And this victory results in some strong emotions, (laughs) hope, relief, joy, satisfaction, and resolve. 
may it be for you because of the victory of our Savior. Let's pray. Father, give us confidence. Alive in our hope. Give us great joy in the victory of your Son. We thank you for him. We need him today and every day. Amen. Amen.